Okay, good morning. Good afternoon again. Can you hear me? I see someone saying they cannot hear. Majore, do you hear me? Yes, yes, Jane, we can hear you well. Okay, very good. Uh, I want us to start this uh, session. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone again. Uh, welcome. My name is Jane Mariera. I'm the Executive Director of the Partnership for Economic Policy. We are hosting this uh, session just to tell you uh, what we do at PEP in terms of designing and contextualizing research to solve specific policy uh, problems. In case you may not know much about PEP, a Partnership for Economic Policy is inter an international NGO uh, whose mandate is building capacity in developing economies to promote greater participation of local experts in policy debates. Uh, we support high quality policy engaged research in order to address specific uh, knowledge gaps and inform policies with reliable evidence from a local perspective. Uh, we also do so by addressing a variety of development policy challenges, uh, ranging from employment to food security and climate change uh, due to uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, or rather moving on to COVID-19 crisis. Uh, PEP has a global reach. Uh, we have so far, uh, for the 18 years that PEP has been in operation, supported uh, more than 300 projects in uh, more than 60 developing countries. Uh, and we've, uh, we have about 16,000 people who are registered on the PEP website. And those people uh, get regular updates from PEP on what is happening in PEP and uh, all over the world because we give updates that we think are very important for development uh, researchers. So why are we here today? Uh, what are the objectives of this webinar? Uh, why we thought that we wanted to have this webinar is because PEP has successfully, uh, or PEP has been very successful in high quality and uh, policy research with 50% and more of our work being published in high uh, ranking journals and uh, more than 50% of our results being taken up uh, to influence policy. The, objectives, uh, the objective of this webinar therefore is to learn from us or from our approach uh, as to how to produce quality research that is evident from both a local and policy perspective. Uh, the program that we have today, uh, in the first instance, we are going to uh, give you a preview of the PEP approach. And this will be co-presented by two of my colleagues. One of them uh, is Dr. Maria, Ma Maria Raura Azua, who is the director of PEP Experimental Research Group and she'll be discussing the scientific dimension of the PEP approach. And then we'll have Ms. Majore Alain, who is the, our Director of Communication and Monitoring and Evaluation, and who is in charge of the policy dimensions of PEP uh, projects. Once they are done, we'll have three of our PEP researchers who will be discussing their own experience of applying this approach through projects that in their home countries. The first one we will have is actually more than a researcher because he's also a PEP research fellow and also a PEP resource person. And this is Dr. Guillermo Cruces, uh, who is based in Argentina. Then we have one of our researchers, Mr. Sebastian Shaba, uh, who is working on Guinea-Bissau. And then we have uh, Dr. Revison Kiwara uh, from Marawi. Uh, from there, we will have a uh, question and answers and we discuss and then conclude. Just to give you a few housekeeping rules, during the presentations, uh, please 
make use of the Q and A box, question and answer, and be monitoring your questions, your suggestions, your comments. And then uh, we will, uh, I will share these questions with the panelists at the appropriate times. Uh, but please keep, keep your audios muted so that at least we do not have any interruptions. And during the Q&A, you can feel free to raise your hands. Uh, we will ensure that uh, we can um, unmute your microphone and you can ask your question. So feel free, we'll give adequate time for question and answer. And thereafter, we will encourage you to interact with the speakers uh, because uh, we'll be accessible. We'll give you some email addresses through which you can reach us. So uh, the format of the webinar, we'll have 80 minutes of presentations, uh, plus 20 to 25 minutes of question and answers. Uh, the 80 minutes is not cast on stone. We could have rest time depending on how engaging or how long the panelists want to speak. Uh, and then we believe that the 20 to 25 minutes or even slightly longer will be enough for our Q&A session. So uh, without further ado, I'm first going to go to our two uh, main uh, first presenters, Maria Laura and Marjorie, to start us off. But after that, I'll come and introduce the panelists so that then they'll take their session. So I'll ask Marjorie to share uh, some slides. And then uh, I believe Maria Laura will start with a short presentation to tell us about the PEP approach. And uh, they will call present with Marjorie. And then uh, from there, uh, we, 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 you, may be, you can feel free to put your questions on the chat, on the Q&A, but we'll address them at the appropriate time. So without further ado, let me invite Marjorie to share the screen and Maria Laura to pick up her presentation. Thank you and welcome again. Thank you, Shane. I don't, I cannot, put, oh, I, start, I cannot start my, my video. And you cannot start your video? Yeah, 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 I did it, I did it. I have to be enabled by the host. So it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, hello to everyone. Um, and as I, Shane say, uh, said, I, I want to present uh, the PEP approach. The Partnership for Economic Policy has uh, 18 years of trajectory and uh, we have the our main objective is to do capacity building to do a research that is a, a, a contextualized and locally relevant in, in developing countries so i'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some examples of uh, how we do this uh, process with uh, two specific examples and then marjorie is going to explain how we try to engage and and and, and go through the process of um, a, the uh, evidence uh, informed policy advice. So, um, as I, 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 I direct a specific sub program in, in, in PEP that uh, tries uh, to build capacity in uh, either conducting randomized controlled trials or field experiment in developing countries. As, as uh, PEP mandate, we, the, the, the projects have to be led by local researchers that receive intense mentoring uh, uh, by PEP. Uh, these uh, um, process, projects are selected after a rigorous selection process. We offer online and in-class technical training and we provide uh, intense scientific uh, mentorship um, that is uh, constant. Uh, throughout the, the process, we have uh, study visits in the case of uh, the, the program that I work with, also uh, field visits on behalf of the mentor. And then we try to have uh, publications and journal submissions. And I'm going to uh, leave Marjorie a little bit to explain a bit later the, the policy engagement. But I want to, to, to give a couple of examples on how this uh, will, will work in, in, in practice. So our main point is that the, the quality of research has to be very good, but it has to be a focus on uh, researching in problems that are important for local policy context in developing uh, countries. So we have a, a regular calls for proposals. 
uh, thanks to uh, PEPIS funded by several donors such as IDRC, DFID, GAC, and the Hewlett Foundation, but it has some other donors in the past such as AUS, uh, Australian Aid, um, etc. So we have regular call for proposals and we uh, choose um, the, the successful proposals that are going to be engaged uh, with PEP depending on the type of, of, of research for um, a, a, a process between like, a, I don't know, 18 months and 36 months. So uh, after that, they have to, uh, after the process are sel uh, selected, they have a online and in-class technical training and then a process of scientific uh, mentorship. So um, I want to put two examples to see specifically how this uh, um, system works. So my, my first example is uh, in Mongolia, that is a transition country. And the, the research proposal uh, was a, a, propo a joint proposal with the National Mongolian uh, University and the, the Secretary of, of Employment in uh, Ulaanbaatar, that is the capital city. And uh, they have had a vocational training program that has been in place in 2003. And they were ensured that they were using, the, that, that the vocational training program was working. Basically the vocational training program was a program that has been more or less uh, copied from the experience that we have uh, in Latin America with vocational training programs for unemployed, unemployed youth. And they have read the evidence that many of these uh, programs, and Guillermo will come later, but he, he knows quite a lot about this literature, were not showing uh, lasting impacts in uh, vulnerable youth who participate from the, the programs. So they applied for PEP funding to do uh, an impact evaluation of this vocational training program using random assignment to select the, the trainees. Um, and uh, we, we mentor them uh, all through the process of assigning uh, the, the trainees, doing uh, data collection, going through uh, internal uh, ethical review uh, pr uh, protocols, uh, registering the trials, um, etc. So after two years, we uh, could finish the, the evaluation and uh, we uh, confirmed that uh, we didn't have uh, long lasting effects uh, in Mongolia as in Latin America. And the only ones who were benefiting uh, were the ones at high, higher levels of education and weren't poor. So this was a little bit uh, um, uh, not fulfilling the mandate of the program that was produced, uh, uh, giving vocational uh, training for uh, poor um, uh, youth, um, for poor uh, young individuals. So um, the, the, one of the outlets of this uh, uh, research project was that the, um, the government received a loan from the World Bank to redesign the program in a way that would be more, more favorable to, towards including um, poor uh, uneducated youth uh, individuals. Um, the, the program is, is being implemented right now, and I guess that the World Bank is doing uh, their own evaluation, uh, but um, this was very useful for the researchers in the university. Also, then we had a, a local national conferences and inter participation in international research conference and publications in peer-reviewed um, uh, um, papers, uh, journals, sorry. Uh, what challenges do we face through this uh, process? Well, we have a lot of budget cuts. The government had to cut the budget, so we have to adjust our sample. Uh, we have changes of government that wanted to discontinue the, the, the evaluation. A uh, sort of experience that we, we usually uh, have uh, while doing this, this research and having uh, uh, the possibility to work with, with local researchers who know the context, who uh, understand what is going on in the, in the, in the, in the countries is very important. And the second example was uh, an unconditional cash transfer for, uh, for all the um, population uh, in Ekiti State in Nigeria. The, the idea of this evaluation was to have an evaluation done within the uh, government. They wanted external uh, researchers that weren't um, involved directly with the government. So we went through the same process that we went with the Mongolian, uh, with the Mongolian teams. 
uh, try to look at uh, the effects of the um, program on uh, mental health, uh, consumption, expenditure, and, and labor supply. And then the intervention was rolled out uh, to another, to some other Nigerian uh, states. We also have to deal with changes of government and, and some more, uh, more or less uh, different degrees of friendliness towards the, the evaluation, but the evaluation was successfully finished. So uh, these two examples shows the way that we engage with uh, local researchers and, and local governments and how we uh, conduct our, our research and capacity building program uh, within uh, PEP. Uh, now, without further ado, I will, I will pass the, the microphone to, to Marjorie so she can uh, give a little bit more details of how we engage uh, in this process of uh, research co-production. Thank you. Um, thank you, Maria Laura. Um, yes, hi. So, uh, as Maria Laura was describing, PEP, the PEP Grand Plus model has is a dual um, support program, which comprises two different systems. One, um, one support system to ensure that the research um, is, that is led locally is of high quality, so providing rigorous uh, scientific support and peer review. And the second system, the parallel system, is there's another one to, to ensure that uh, the research is aligned and responsive uh, to specific policy needs. Um, just to go back a little bit, because we, to contextualize how PEP works, we have we support different types of projects or projects that that uh, use different types of methodologies. Uh, the the projects described by Maria Laura are um, experimental research projects, um, and you know the RCTs and the field experiments. They require some kind of collaboration with the program implementers. And that collaboration creates a, a direct link um, or a channel for uptake. But there are other types of projects like those using microeconomic analysis uh, or, or CGE modeling uh, techniques that use existing data and don't necessarily require that kind of collaboration. Um, so, so in these cases, that's where we need uh, a strategy. We need to have a strategy to, to get researchers to take on further steps uh, to understand the specific policy needs that they're trying to um, address or how the research is supposed to feed into a specific decision process. So the system we created uh, in PEP to achieve this uh, starts at proposal stage. Um, all, well now, all applicant project teams are required to include at least two members um, who work or based or work to, uh, in the government institution that are considered uh, as the primary target or the first hand user of the findings. That's a minimum for all. Of course, there are some projects who are led directly in collaboration uh, or led by a government unit, as those that we'll discuss later. Um, but to have at least two members part of the government is a minimum, is a minimum requirement. And also in the proposal template, we have a series of questions that uh, sort of lead or force researchers to initiate some kind of, some kind of policy context analysis. Uh, for, of course, they have to identify the specific policy problem um, or question or decision that the evidence is meant to help inform. But they also have to study a little bit about the history of the interventions related to policy or the, related to the issue and um, the stakeholders involved, they also have to provide evidence that they have consulted uh, previously with the stakeholders. Um, they have to discuss about the political calendar that might apply during the pro research uh, project and the budget constraints. Um, and uh, we also introduce um, the idea that there's a distinction between their research questions and the policy questions. So that's kind of an introduction to policy context analysis as part of the proposal development process. Then once um, projects are selected, our support, uh, our strategy is a four dimension strategy to ensure the alignment um, with policy. The first one I'll talk a little bit more about because I really think it's one of the key components uh, and 
it's one of the most recent features introduced in the PEP support system as well. And that is a um, uh, policy paper. We now require that all project, uh, project teams develop a policy paper as a mandatory deliverable. And that's in addition to their research outputs, so the research uh, papers. A policy paper analysis, uh, its objective is to position um, the research evidence into the broader policy decision framework. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, the, the policy decision is a choice. Uh, you have policymakers have different options to choose from or to decide to invest in you know, one course of action or another. And uh, the policy paper analysis uh, is designed to inform that choice by comparing the different options and the pros and cons and the harms and benefits of the different options available. And this evaluation is based on the criteria that are relevant from the policy point of view. Um, so the comparing the options in, based on the effectiveness, yes, of course, research can help do that, equity issues as well. But uh, other considerations are also involved in that analysis, like feasibility. Is that policy option technically feasible or in terms of cost implications? Um, wherever possible, we ask the research teams to integrate a cost benefit analysis as part of that evaluation. So um, the decision to require policy papers, I would say, is the result of um, nearly 10 years of, of, of failure, uh, of continual failure in trying to um, produce effective policy briefs based on research papers. Uh, the research papers, uh, the purpose of a research paper is not to inform policy. It's not to produce a policy recommendation. Uh, its purpose is to produce information on the very specific aspect or angle of a policy issue. And the result is usually communicated as a standalone information. Uh, and you can't formulate a, a policy recommendation based on a single information uh, because it's, it's just one piece of the puzzle. And it's literally, I'd say a policy decision is a puzzle. And there are many different factors that are taken into account to determine the best course of action. Um, I think uh, that's, that may be one of the reasons why research is not generally sought as a primary source of input for policy advice, because it's too partial or it's incomplete or one-sided. It's not a ready to use kind of input. And not to mention the communication issues, uh, obviously the way that research is communicated usually. And it also may be the main source of the gap that we can seem to fill in the research policy interface. Um, and it's, it's, it's a communication issue, yes, but not so much in terms of language, the language we use, but um, in terms of, rather in terms of contextualizing and, and translating the research evidence into its policy uh, context or perspective, showing how it can contribute to inform a policy decision. That's what the policy paper does. Of course, a policy paper is not a complete assessment of all options available, it, and, it, and, and nobody can know all the, the factors that really that will matter for the decision maker, unless you're part of a very close circle. But it's still an important step towards filling that gap. Um, and most importantly, it helps researchers understand what are the specific questions uh, that their research uh, should help provide answers for and uh, to be useful for a decision maker. So that's uh, a key feature of our strategy. The other ones, I'll go quickly. Um, next one is mentorship. It's also very important, but it's more straightforward. We provide what we call a policy. We assign at Project Selection, we assign what we call a policy outreach mentor. Uh, these people, these are known experts based either in the same country or the same region as where the research is conducted. And uh, they are familiar with the country's pol policy and institutional uh, context. And they also have experience in advising policymakers. 
Um, so these mentors will provide periodic support throughout the project cycle from proposal to dissemination. Uh, of course, to help develop the policy paper, understand the policy context, the policy concerns, and the appropriate policy messaging um, required, but also they will help them from the start develop or define their stakeholder analysis and design an effective outreach and dissemination strategy. Um, now, after mentorship, we have uh, the third component would be our own ME system. Uh, monitoring and evaluation system, which uh, through which we require all researchers to produce, uh, to submit reports on their consultation activities. So they have to report how they consulted with stakeholders and what came out of it uh, throughout the, several times throughout the project cycle. And even grant payments are conditional on the submission of these reports. So that's another strategy to ensure that the research continues to be aligned with these policy needs and the policy context that may evolve. Um, and finally, the last component is uh, training. But I'm not sure I would call that training, but rather workshops. We provide intensive workshops um, to, for researchers to, to review with them the best practices in terms of <clears throat> engaging and communicating with policy. And these workshops are provided at two different times in the cycle. First, um, uh, at, this, at the proposal stage to, to discuss an outreach and uh, context analysis, and then uh, right before they enter the dissemination phase. So that sums it for the um, PEP approach for policy engagement. So Jane, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Majori. Uh, we have, uh, we are going to the next session Maybe there are just two quick questions. Maybe we could just uh, respond to these ones because these are specific to this particular um, PEP session. The first one, uh, Francois is asking, is it mandatory for the research team to choose the policy makers as a team leader? And then we have another one from Violet who is asking, uh, sorry, uh, the research paper funded by PEP always done by a team of researchers. Majori, do you want to answer those two? Uh, sure. Um, very, very straightforward, yeah. Yeah, well, first, the, it's mandatory. Um, it depends on the project, but the minimum requirement uh, is that there must be two members members, not team leaders, who are uh, part work from government policy official, government officials. Um, they don't have to be the team leader. They just have to be members of the team. I don't know if that answered the first question. Um, if not, please let me know. The second one, the research papers are, yes, written by the research teams, and so all the policy papers. But it's true that we will, within a team, we have a mixed team of research uh, researchers and government affiliated members. And the researchers are mainly responsible of the research papers and the government affiliated members are mainly responsible of the policy paper. But we see mostly these are mixed and they, they are collaboration and they work together. Um, especially on the policy papers, researchers are also involved. It's part of the capacity building process. Again, I'm not sure if that answers uh, directly the question. And if not, please um, let me know in the chat. OK, uh, thank you. I believe it does, because uh, the first one is basically that, that you must have uh, both the researchers and the policy makers. And the second question, whether PEP research must always be done by a team of researchers. We do not find individual researchers. It must always be a team and we do specify uh, the, we, we do have a criteria as to how we expect that team to be uh, composed, uh, but that is always taken care of. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next um, uh, part of the panel. So we are going to come to the three panelists, uh, but because each of them will be answering three specific questions, we'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Guillermo Cruces, 
Uh, Guillermo, as you prepare, let me just uh, introduce you briefly. Uh, Guillermo is, a, is the deputy director of the Center for Distributive Labor and Social Studies, CEDRAS, CEDRAS at the Universidad Nacional de la Prata in Argentina. Uh, he's a researcher at Argentina's National, Sci National Scientific and Technical Research Council, CONICET, and he's also a professor of economics at the University of Nottingham in the UK. He is a research affiliate at J. Paul, a research fellow at IZA, and also as PEP. As I said earlier, he's also a resource person uh, with PEP. His research is focused on public and labor economics in Latin America and the Caribbean, and on the economics of perceptions and preference groups in general. So I have, I'm going to uh, ask Guillermo to share uh, with us his experience as a PEP researcher in this particular uh, context. And he'll be sharing with us uh, three uh, questions. The first one is, what was the policy question that you wanted to address in your project? And why is this relevant? The second one, what are the main challenges and runnings from working with the government? And finally, how has PEP helped in the process? So we'll give you uh, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. If you want to take rest, uh, it's even better for us, but uh, you can take the floor. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, thank you for the organizers. Um, <clears throat> thank you for setting up this very interesting uh, session. I, I just realized that a, a square shirt is not working well with the video, so I'm very sorry about that. I'm still adapting to uh, this type of, of, um, of format. So um, I just um, we have three questions guiding ourselves. So in my case, um, I've been working with Pep. Um, for, for, for a while. I think my first conference was in 2008 in Lima, and it, all, it was always very engaging. But um, let me stress what I think makes um, PEP unique from my side. So um, even though I've, I, I worked in, in government, I was under secretary for development in, in um, a, a couple of years ago, uh, I am a, a nerd. I am a professor in, in um, myself and i've always found um PEP very useful and very engaging in terms of um making me uh see not only see perhaps that i saw but sell and and present and and and, and make um emphasis on the policy side and 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 on the production of um <clears throat> evidence-based policy so everything we do uh with pep um, is always um, is always um, we can't hear you are you there Guillermo, you cannot hear you. Oh, okay. We had lost. You. Hello. I'm sorry. Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, if if this happens again, I will ask you for one minute, and I will switch to cellular. Uh, is was it everything okay in the uh, so far? Yeah, but we lost you for maybe two seconds. Okay, I'm sorry about that. So um, I was saying that. Um, uh, Maria Laura, Marjorie, Jane um, were always. Uh, very, um, very useful and very um, helpful. But if I had to choose one of the aspects, it was um, how to engage with our government partners and how to make our um, research and results stand out in terms of uh, their policy use. Uh, so not only um, estimating ergodic preferences um, over risk or that kind of stuff that maybe we would end up doing. So uh, to, to, to address directly the three um, very useful questions that the, the panel organizers have set up, um, the, the first one was, 
what was the policy question that motivated us and, and how uh, it worked? So the, the advantage I had um, when, when I proposed, when I made this proposal um, to PEP was that I, I had been working uh, with government at the treasury. Um, and, and we had an issue of a, a very generous program of VAT rebates um, for beneficiaries of conditional cash transfers. Okay, so um, when they used their uh, program affiliated debit card for purchases. So if beneficiaries of these cash transfers, uh, instead of taking cash out of ATMs, um, they took their cards and spent money with their debit cards in stores, they would get a huge rebate, about 15% um, of, of their purchases. Uh, and yet the take up of that, um, of that benefit was very, very low. It was about 20% of the beneficiaries ever made a purchase and then qualified for a rebate uh, with their card. So uh, the question was, um, was twofold, had two sides uh, to it. One was uh, an issue of financial inclusion on uh, why the poor, these were overwhelmingly poor uh, beneficiaries, why the poor were not using um, their, their debit cards, even though there was a, a very large um, cash incentive for them uh, to do so. So there was an issue of, of why um, they were not adopting these technology. Uh, and of course, there was a, a broader issue of benefit take-up, uh, which, um, which was very interesting to study uh, in and by, by itself. So um, the, the, good, um, the good news was that this was a, a very relevant um, question, we had a population of about 2 million beneficiaries. So these were the parents of about 4.5 million kids, uh, which is uh, about half of the kids in, in Argentina. So this was really, uh, it was not a, a niche program or a little thing. It was something substantial. There was a, a very large budget allocated to this program, uh, and it was not being used. So on the on the treasury side, my, my the, the after I left government, but I was still in touch with my colleagues, they were worried about this money that was unused and the, the let's say the social development side of the policy question, the, the, the policy partners were worried that these um, resources were there but were not reaching um, the, the, the beneficiaries. So um, this was really, I would say, the most uh, policy relevant um, study I've made. Maybe not study, but the most policy relevant intervention I made, and, and uh, in that sense, um, PEP was crucial in helping me shape the research question and shape the intervention. What we ended up doing was sending uh, about um, 1 million uh, text messages to these beneficiaries, um, reminding them that this, um, that this benefit was there, um, and, and we increased take up by about 20%, okay? So it was still low, but we, the, the, the difference we made with this very cheap intervention was huge. Uh, and so one of the things um, Pep uh, helped me with uh, was how to handle um, having, let me say, let me exaggerate, complex or sophisticated, say, research questions uh, with something that was useful uh, to, to the partner. So I remember, uh, um, I remember, uh, emerging from, from one session um, with, with, with my PEP colleague saying, well, uh, what I understood was my paper can be nice, um, but what I need this to be is something useful uh, for my government partners. I knew that, but it was reinforced and uh, in a sense, um, again, maybe uh, uh, well, exaggerating the words, I, I, I thought, well, I don't need to handle. Uh, um, <clears throat> I don't need. I, I don't need to give my my colleagues a paper. Uh, I need to handle them uh, a, a policy report that has to be some sort of public policy consultancy, something they can relate to, they can understand, and they can use. And so I managed to wiggle some behavioral economics and and some and some uh, complicated or, or or more sophisticated questions within the whole design. Um, 
but by but keeping the messages and the and the and the results simple and usable by the social security agency that was setting this up. So um, <clears throat> I would say that uh, Peb was crucial. Um, I've changed the order. I'm sorry. I'm answering question three first, uh, which I think is more relevant. So uh, Peb, Peb was crucial in terms of uh, mixing the the technical and the policy uh, relevant uh, aspects and, and blending them so I could I could um, satisfy the different customers. One of the customers was, of course, myself well, or, or, or my my um, my own. Uh, academic research agenda. The other one was, of course, the government. Um, also, um, Marjorie mentioned the the, <clears throat> the MNE system of PEP. Uh, there's a nice. Um, we have a very nice uh, internet, uh, and we have reminders and PEP staff reminding us. You have milestones, and you have um, you have this report that is during this period, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That was very useful to organize the work, but also. Uh, I knew I had to provide reports about my contacts with um, government um, partners, okay? So it was not only maybe uh, one meeting or an email exchange. Um, writing it down in the form of a report helped me uh, think about what this had been useful for, um, what, what I could have um, taken, uh, um, what would, I could have accomplished with one of the meetings, Etc. So um, the whole array, and let me tell you, there are many steps uh, in in this uh, in these projects. But the whole array of one technical uh, report, one policy engagement report, one communication report, all of those steps were very useful um, for the project. Again, I could have done a, um, a paper without those. I, I know how to do papers, but um, having the whole package. Uh, um, was very important. Um, and also in terms of um, doing policy briefs, the, 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 the help I, I got from, from PEP in terms of communication and, 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 and engaging um, journalists and, and presenting these results was very, very useful. I, I, um, going from an abstract or from a, a table to something that um, the different publics uh, can grasp uh, is not something obvious for, for researchers, and, and I learned a lot from it. Um, and I'll go to the challenges um, of working with, with, um, with the government in a minute, um, but um, I also wanted to stress that in this sense, um, having so much engagement was very useful to build um, long-lasting um, uh, relationship with government agents, so with government partners. So uh, I had the advantage that uh, I had been part of an administration, and so uh, after leaving the administration, as a researcher, I still had contacts, uh, but I developed contacts much further down the, the chain, and, and those contacts are still useful today uh, um, for setting up other projects. So engaging um, engaging with government partners and making something I hope uh, useful for them and and um, and relevant for them and understandable uh, by them uh, was also I mean was not only key uh, for the success or the relative success of these project but for uh, having these long-lasting relationships that I hope will um, will prove useful in terms of uh, of um, developing more projects. Now, um, what are the, the challenges of working um, with government? I, I, I need um, I need a, a, a two hour and a half session for that, Jane. Just on, on just to, on my own. Is that okay? No, I think not. But uh, let I mean, me no, let me. You 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 <laughs> no. Basically, I just have uh, less than ten minutes, so please. No, of course not, Jane. Thank you so much. No, let, let me stress uh, the, the challenges on my side. Um, one of the main challenges in general for these type of projects, I think, is to, um, is to um, convince uh, your government partners um, 
to convince the government partners uh, that we um, that the research is going to be useful for them. So in this case, uh, as I said, we're fortunate enough that um, that the, the the question was really something different agencies had their eyes on and, and we were providing uh, um, an answer or a partial answer on what was going on here. So our conclusion, I didn't mention that, was that uh, there were two sides to it. There was an issue which had to be addressed in terms of financial literacy and, and, and helping um, beneficiaries uh, learn and to, to acquire the custom of using their debit cards. But there was also a supply issue. And, and so I'm in touch with, with the new administration now and I'm giving some informal advice uh, in terms of uh, having point of sales terminals in the stores um, in, in small, um, more deprived areas so beneficiaries can, uh, can use them. And in, um, in the context of COVID, our research became much more relevant. So this was done uh, in 2000, end of 2018. Uh, but in, in the context of COVID, having people not going to ATMs and not queuing up, et cetera, just using their debit cards, it became something very relevant. And so these, um, these contacts that I'm telling, uh, that I told you I made uh, with, with different um, agencies were very useful in terms of providing new support and new, um, and new discussions with policy partners, even after the end of the project. But... Uh, so th the first challenge <clears throat> is usually convincing that the research can be useful for a relevant question uh, that was solved, but it's not, uh, or, or it was okay, I think, but but it's not always obvious. Uh, the second challenge, um, I think, is um, convincing them that there are no uh, downsides to the to the um, to the research. So, in in my experience, uh, government agent uh, government. Um, policymakers uh, are understandably risk averse um, in the sense that uh, what they see is that uh, the, the best possible scenario is, well, uh, some researcher got a paper published and the worst case scenario is a newspaper learns about some negative results and, 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 and I'm going to get fired. Okay, that's simplifying I think that's the the view of the policymaker so um, there's a lot of work in convincing them that one uh, this is not just a paper this is something that can be useful um, that can be useful for um, for policymakers um, for their day-to-day -day work for for the impact their uh, policies make uh, and two uh, showing them that there are no downsides and in that sense uh, we had, uh, in this case, it was not really relevant um, because there was no real danger in, in this experiment. It was just uh, having people use their debit cards. But for instance, uh, we had other cases in which um, the intervention could have exposed uh, people to going out and there was COVID. And so uh, th all these discussions are very useful to, to, to have and to, to be very frank with, with government. The other... Um, the other main challenge uh, in my case, but I think this happens in, in most cases, was that we had to work with um, the Argentina's treasury, we had to work with the Argentina's social security agency, and we had to work with Argentina's tax authority. So three very big, very strong, very um, independent, unfortunately, um, partners. Uh, and so, playing nice and showing each of these partners how your um, research was going to be relevant uh, was one thing, convincing them that they had to share information with, um, with the other was also uh, challenging. And, and, and um, I think that the, uh, we were successful in that. It, it, it's one of the few projects in which, uh, research projects in which this three agencies in Argentina work together and share the data. It, it sounds, it may sound silly, but uh, those of you who've worked with governments uh, know that if, for instance, even the tax authority that nominally depends on the treasury in Argentina uh, is not always 
very keen to share information. So this took uh, a lot of time and a lot of um, a lot of uh, playing nice and convincing people that this was going to be useful. Um, and the the third challenge is that um, I think that the design needs to be um, needs to be the the design of the research in this case this was an experiment with text messages etc it needs to be robust to changes so um, the social security agency uh, was not keen on 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 one of the treatments uh, we had which uh, referred to using cards in in stores and 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 how 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 many others were using it because they considered that um, really there were very few people using it. So they didn't want to, it was not lying, but they didn't want to boast about something they thought was not, um, was not very, something to be proud of. Um, and it was completely understandable. And so a whole arm of, of our experiment was shut down by the communications people of the social security agency. Uh, and this was okay. I mean, it was a, um, a question we wanted to address, but it, in, it implied a cost for one of our partners and so, uh, after consulting with, with Maria Lauda, and we we agreed with, I mean, it, it was not our choice really, but we didn't push uh, too much on this issue. We just adapted. So uh, being flexible, being patient uh, is is uh, is something you need in in one of these projects. I think um, I'm, I'm okay with time. So um, I just wanted to thank you all again for uh, attending this uh, session, and I'm looking forward to hear from, from my colleagues. Okay, thank you very much, Guillermo, for uh, that uh, very um, um, clear uh, discussion of how you are going, you've gone about in your project. Now we are going to listen to the next researcher. Please keep your questions for him uh, to answer it. We'll have time to discuss. We want to hear the story from Guinea-Bissau and I'm going to ask our next presenter to get ready. This is Mr. Sebastian Schaber. Uh, Mr. Schaber is a German national who has lived in the Americas and Africa and has spent the last two years in Guinea-Bissau he works there as a fellow of the Overseas Development Institute, as an economic advisor at the Ministry of Economy and Finance, specifically in the Directorate General for Forecasting and Economic Studies. In, his cap in this capacity, and together with the PEP uh, project team that he is working with, he has worked on policy impact analysis, business climate studies, and the impact of COVID-19 on small uh, and medium enterprises in Guinea-Bissau. So uh, like Guillermo, he's going to take us through uh, three different questions. The first one, again, is uh, the policy questions that he and his team wanted to address in their project and why it is relevant or why they thought it is relevant. What are the main challenges and runnings from the working with the government, especially as an economic advisor, and then now partnering in this particular project? And then finally, how PEP has helped in the process. So Sebastian, you have not more than 20 minutes. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, <clears throat> yes, hello everybody. So I'm from talking from Guinea-Bissau. Uh, maybe I just uh, want to introduce everybody real quick to, uh, to Guinea-Bissau. So we know um, where we're talking. So I'm in Guinea-Bissau here, south of Senegal, um, northwest of Guinea, Guinea-Conakry, as we also call it. So right on the west coast of West Africa, very beautiful country. And um, I'm going to talk about cashew nuts. So here, those are the cashew nuts. Cashew nuts, Guinea-Bissau. So this cashew nuts are the export of Guinea-Bissau. And if we were in person, Maria Laura is a big fan. I would have brought cashew nuts for everybody to taste 
them from Guinea Bissau. But uh, this has to be virtual, so it just works like this today. And just for everybody, because I didn't know, this is how cashew got nuts grow um, on the tree. So just as a few fun facts in the beginning. Um, so why are cashew nuts so important for Guinea Bissau? So I already said that almost more than 90% of the official exports are raw cashew nuts. And almost everybody in Guinea Bissau has cashew nuts. So um, all over the country is full of cashew nut trees. And actually 80% of the families in Guinea Bissau depend directly on the income that they make when they sell their cashew nuts. So, and for large portion of them, it's also the main income that they get throughout the whole year. Throughout the whole year, I mean, the cashew campaign in Guinea Bissau, different than in other countries, runs usually from March until August, just before the rain starts. And during this time, cashew producers can choose when and to whom and to what price um, they want to sell their, their cashew nuts. Well, not necessarily they cannot choose it that freely because um, people have come to their, uh, to their house, usually at where they buy it and the access within the country is, is not so easy. And then in August is also when the rain starts so they have to usually sell it until then because they cannot save it through two months of rain before it goes bad. Um, with my team in the Ministry of Finance, I, when I first arrived in my first week here, we went into the field and interviewed cashew farmers just to understand a bit how they work. And what struck me immediately is that they basically have no information works. They have very little knowledge about um, the market in general. So how does the government go about that usually? So in March, the selling usually starts. And in March is when the government gives a reference price. So in the beginning of the campaign, they say more or less kind of as an indicative price. Some argue it's, um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fixed price, it's a minimum price. Others say it's um, it's more indicative price, but they give this price. They, the government sets one price, and but of course prices are different throughout the whole country. Prices vary throughout the time, um, so this is the only policy kind of that the government has informative for the for the for the cashew producers. And I just want to show one picture here about. Um, the cashew market price. Let me quickly explain the graph that we see here. So on this axis, on the y-axis, we have the price in uh, um, franc cefa, the currency here, in, per kilogram of raw cashew nuts. And then here we have the years. So we go from 2000 to 2020. And we see that it used to be the export price, which is the orange dots here, they used to be, until 2015, they used to be more or less stable. So, and, the, and considering the farm gate price was, of course, a little bit less because of margins of intermediaries and taxes and what so. So, so there, was, there was not much volatility. The prices were not changed so much. Farmers knew what they were getting. But then export prices increased substantially. And with it, also the farm gate price, of course. Well, not of course, but it did. But then, so here in 2000, so it was this, it was usually the farm, farm gate price was around 200, 250 sefer, which is about um, 40 cents per kilo of a, for, of a raw cashew nut, 40 euro cents, maybe $50 cents per kilo of raw cashew nut. And when, in, and it, went up until a thousand. So the average price in 2017 was 800 um, sefer per kilo, but in some places and at some point it actually went up up the way to 2000 sefer. So, um, so this was of, of course great years, but then in 2018, even though the price, the market was collapsing, the cashew market, the, the, 
the, the political authorities gave a reference price because everybody was like, well, thousand thousand Sefas is, um, they set a reference price of thousand Sefas, which was completely impossible to reach. It was more like a political move, potentially. And, but the cashew price was collapsing over time, over time. And people were hoarding their money, uh, hoarding their cashew. They were not selling. They were waiting for that price to happen because it was the only information that they have. They, they were trusting it, that the price would reach there again where it was in 2000, 2017. But actually the price was de decreasing. And it was that it was a, they could have gotten 700, they couldn't have 100, 500, but they were storing it. And in the end, before the rainy season, the market stalled. Before the rainy season, everybody had to sell it. And most, the average price actually was just over 400 sephas. So when you see that the, the differential in 2018 between the export price and um, the farm gate price was huge. And this was kind of the end of the year was when we did the survey in the, in the field. And we were like, okay, we, we need to find something um, we need to take care of this efficiency. We need to take something to give market information to the cashew producers. And of course, market information um, services exist in, in, in many countries already on many products. And research says that when the prices are volatile, when the production is very dispersed and it, the, country, the pr production in the country is low diversified, so people are dependent on the good, market information system actually have a good chance of working. And this is the characteristics of Guinea-Bissau. So we thought, okay, we need to get the information out there about how this works. And I mean, it's usually, it is a task of the government. The government should be, um, or has the task, it's a public good to give that information out. Everybody can profit, profit from it. So it should be something um, that the government can do. But there was only a small private incentive to do it by a mobile phone company to send this information out. But this information failed, or this market information service actually failed. For them, it was not profitable enough. Oh, let me just stop sharing maybe the presentation. So you just see me, you got the, you got the idea. So, um, so it was not profitable for the, for, for the phone company anymore to send information out. Um, it was kind of an incentive with um, with the development institution. So there was also some political parties actually involved to give price information of the cashew nuts. But these finances kind of um, caused sustainability issues. And we also learned that, that the information that was shared by this service was actually not um, very informative because it was the average price in the whole country that a farmer could get at the moment, that is practice at the moment. And we were, when we were kind of making our application to, um, to PEP, we were, we wanted to, um, we, we wanted to, um, to understand, to, to in, in, um, implement, implement or kind of increase the take up rate of this. But we understood that we talked, we actually got lucky. We got to talk to an NGO in France who does market information system everywhere in West Africa, NITIDE. And NITIDE, they told us, it doesn't make sense to tell them what they currently get. They need information about what they could get in the, like what are, what are price tendency and tell them a bit about also the market situation. So we partnered with, with NITIDE and they do cash market information. So we created a new market information system. Um, we, when I talk, we, it's, it's, it's the people in the government that I also work with and a team of researchers, um, of international researchers uh, in Europe who have been in Guinea-Bissau before. And we created a new market information system. And the, the, what we wanted to find out is if we share this market, if we create good market information, information saying we describe what the market is like at the moment, and prices, how they develop likely in the future to get farmers a bit of perspective where they could go, if that can increase the revenue that the farmer farmer gets. So we de decided to do an RCT um, with this project. Now, this was kind of the introduction and the policy relevance of this. Now I want to get to question two, is which are the main challenges and learning from working with the government? 
I think, um, let me talk about um, potentially the challenges first, uh, because um, we we applied to PEP with a team of different organiz uh, of different institutions in the government. So we had the Ministry of Agriculture, then we had the Ministry of Finance with the studies team, we had the National Agency of Kashu in Guinea-Bissau, um, and we we wanted to work with all of them, but we realized it's a bit talking working with across different institutions is a bit of a problem because internet in Guinea-Bissau in the ministries it's um, it's almost non-existent so people would have to, to use their own money to come online um, which was a kind of a key issue we had frequent frequent meetings in the Ministry of Finance but that means from the Ministry of Agriculture to come from the other side of the city um, to attend this this was also this made it a bit difficult to have always frequent information that we were working across different institutions. Another problem was in Guinea-Bissau, unfortunately, the politics is really unstable. Over the last two years I've been here, I have experienced four different governments, and this always means mean different changes of key personnel. So, for example, the, the president of an institution was changed with whom we signed a memorandum of under understanding. Our boss in the ministry was changed, who was not aware of the project in the beginning, but the other one was. So this, of course, also created um, substantial challenges. And what was a big issue was um, the bureaucratic difficulties that we faced also, because for this, um, we wanted to get a short code that people can call also to get information of that weekly information that we always send out. And getting that short code um, was not only really tired, like it was a lot of negotiations, but it was also really expensive to get it. Um, and yeah, and the risk is also because of the changes of the government. Um, it is a bit like we had, a, we had a boss that was very keen to do research. Another one is more like an accountant that kind of does not value so much the research that is done. So that's of course also was um, a bit of a problem, but I think once we potentially have results out, this might be um, if we find um, good things, we can potentially um, um, discuss and involve everybody again why we have these results. I mean, the learning now has been substantial. The learning really, because when I talk about this questionnaire that we did in the beginning when I just came, this was pen and paper. We went with public transport into the field, very low budget. It was it was quite ad hoc. So working with the um, the learning that um, we get we got into the whole government was immense. So the kind of advance that the studies team did from like a non-random what has been just their kind of family to really randomized control trial teach them um, the information about it has been immense learning from them for them but also it was always a very um, a reciprocal information because i mean i'm I, I consider myself almost at a local but of course they have the local knowledge they know what we can say in the messages that we send out we can say they know kind of what is important to say what is too diff difficult potentially to grasp and um, it was also really helpful to to plan with them together to to make shared tasks and combine tasks but always have a deadline on when these have to be um, have to be implemented and then last of all least of course we work with local telecommunications we work with um, the national um, agency of cashew so having the government also in it of course helped substantially to to create boundaries uh, not boundaries to get to to um, to bound with these organizations so um, i think learning with them and learning um, we have learned a lot and um, and and yeah we all have learned um, a lot together um, just um, before I finish, I, the third question, very important, is how has PEP helped in the process? I mean, PEP has been extraordinary in many, many ways. I mean, we had two conferences where they benefited from cashews from Guinea-Bissau, 
but we benefited from a lot of feedback, from a lot of knowledge, from how to um, how to design our uh, from how to design our our study. In the beginning, we had three treatment arms, but they were like, no, this is way too much. We cut it down to two treatment arms. I mean, in the end, unfortunately, we had only one treatment number, but it was always very um, good discussions with them. What is the best way to proceed? And we made the methodology, uh, the methodology a lot better, um, thanks to the help. Of course, also with the COVID impact that we had, um, I mean, we wanted to go into the field again to, to get information from them, but they were like, okay, if you cannot go to the field, maybe in October, um, to get this information, why don't you do a call center? So we actually set up a call center and just call people with a short questionnaire just to understand at what price have they sold their cash or not. I mean, very important is also the budget that PEP has provided because without that budget, it would have been not possible to travel in the region to do baseline service of a month with six teams, six cars in the field. I mean, we get very valuable information out of this, but only thanks to the budget that was provided. And also in the ministry, the research work is usually not um, part necessarily. So people, they have a lot of priorities and due to the budget, we could kind of um, help them to in incentivize this. And maybe last but not least, as also my previous um, person was saying is because of the reports, we always had deadlines we had to accomplish, we could plan and um, this was really this was really helpful to have these frequent deadlines and deliverables. And we really appreciate this approach from PEP to combine the research with the policies because this also has been a huge learning for the people in the ministry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for a very good exposition, a graphical exposition of your experiences. We'll come back to you. Uh, you can be looking at the question and answer so any questions to you. But uh, meanwhile, now we turn to our last speaker. Uh, Revison, please prepare. So we have uh, Dr. Revison Kiwala uh, from Marawi. And uh, Dr. Revison is an associate professor uh, of economics at the University of Marawi, uh, where he has also served as a Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and also a Deputy Head of the Department of Economics. His research work has been published in many reputable journals, such as Journal of Development Economics, uh, Journal of Agricultural and Food Economics, Research in Labor Economics and Health Economics. So Revison, let's hear from you. Don't take more than 20 minutes so that then we can go to the most exciting uh, part of question and answers. Welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jane. And uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on wherever you are. Can you check your volume, please? Your mic, your volume is a bit low. Is it better now? Is it better? Okay. Can you approach your microphone? Can you get closer to it? Sorry? Can you get closer to your microphone? All right. Uh, am I better now? Much better. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much. As it has been stated, my name is Levison. Uh, from the University of Malawi. We implemented uh, a study, PEP funded study with a team of researchers within the University of Malawi. And uh, our uh, research, uh, we titled it combining, uh, combining uh, training and the uh, SMSs to influence mobile money usage. Now, uh, I'll go straight to the questions uh, that Jane has raised. We have uh, three questions. And on the first question related to the policy questions we wanted to address, I will begin by giving you uh, some background about uh, 
how Malawi is and what issues uh, we wanted to uh, work on. First of all, the main thing we tried to address in our study, we noted that uh, there was uh, or there is a very low uh, financial inclusion uh, in the country, uh, despite uh, taking note that uh, literature is suggesting that when people are uh, financially included, the chances of attaining a higher economic growth and development uh, is high. Uh, <clears throat> but then in our case, uh, we realized that uh, by the time we were developing our proposal, only about 34% of the adults were financially included, which means uh, over 60% uh, they are excluded. The situation was much worse in the rural areas and uh, slightly better in the urban uh, centers. But in general, uh, we are talking of a situation of low uh, financial inclusion. And then we also looked at the literature that also showed that uh, mobile money usage uh, has the potential also to, uh, as an intermediary to take people uh, to uh, financial, form of financial inclusion. So in our case, when you noted this, we said the country, uh, Malawi, which is uh, have very low uh, income levels and it needs uh, to develop, uh, but then we realized that the people are financially excluded. One of the ways to uh, make, to uh, solve this under development uh, problem is to uh, improve on their financial inclusion. And uh, when we were developing the proposal, we also took note of uh, a policy uh, window. And of course, I should already say that uh, this came in when we uh, also, we, when we were uh, being advised uh, by PEP. Malawi uh, started implementing uh, a financial uh, sector development strategy uh, from 2016 to this year. We are finishing implementing uh, this strategy this year. And of course, we knew that uh, our results will be uh, much ready towards the end of the implementation of uh, this strategy. So in this way, we noted that if we work uh, out uh, a research, uh, if, we work, if we conduct a, a study, we'll be in a position to generate information that will help uh, the government uh, when we are revising the financial development strategy. And more importantly, in the financial development strategy, it was uh, highlighted uh, uh, that we have six, uh, I should say we have six uh, strategic objectives in the strategy. And uh, one of the strategies, uh, the strategic objectives uh, is to expand uh, digital payments. So our, our project wanted uh, to, to work on that and as, uh, support the implementation of this strategy by looking at how we can uh, expand, how can uh, the government can expand uh, the use of digital payments. As the time when this strategy was being developed, it was noted that about 99% of all the payments were made by cash, uh, which means that uh, the use of digital transfer of money was almost negligible. And this, uh, needed it to be uh, improved because uh, one, even the, the central government uh, spends a lot of money in printing uh, cash, as well as we have also just noted in the, with the COVID-19 uh, that uh, cash can also be uh, uh, unsafe uh, in, in some uh, situations. And the other thing we noted in the, uh, as we're trying to look at the policy window, we noted that the Malawi financial uh, sector development strategy uh, also wants to leverage on village savings and loan associations, uh, which uh, are saving groups. And the, these, are, apart, we noted that people are financially excluded, but the VSLAs, these are growing uh, significantly. And we noted that because these are a safe interest group, uh, they are growing without, of course, we have a number of NGOs, CARE, uh, and the other NGOs promoting this, but we also have these uh, VSLAs growing on their own. 
uh, we wanted also to make use of these people who are already interested in savings and see if we can uh, work with these people to enhance uh, the use of mobile money and further the use of uh, savings. And uh, of course, the other thing in the Malawi uh, uh, financial uh, sector development strategy, the third uh, strategic objective uh, is to uh, increase uh, consumer empowerment and education. Now, with these three are uh, fifty percent of the strategic uh, objectives uh, in the uh, strategy. So when we saw this policy window, we said, uh, how can we empower consumers to make sure that they use uh, uh, digital payments uh, in their day-to-day -day, uh, activities? Uh, apart from this policy strategy, we also noted that we have. Uh, a legal uh, 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 strategy. The Malawi government, uh, or a legal framework, uh, the, the parliament in Malawi uh, passed the, uh, a payment systems act in 2016. And the, the act, what it does, it gives the Reserve Bank of Malawi uh, a legal uh, tool or, or legal framework to make sure that it enhances the, or it uh, controls and manages the use of uh, the use of uh, mobile uh, money or digital payments. Uh, as I've said, despite having uh, uh, this policy document as well as a good uh, uh, legal uh, framework, we note that, the, as, as I said earlier on, the level of financial inclusion was very low. And uh, we also uh, further uh, noted that even the use of digital payments was uh, very low. If we just uh, look at, uh, if we just look at the uh, mobile money payment is safe. We noted that only 21% of the population, by the time we were developing uh, this uh, proposal, we are uh, having an active mobile money account, which uh, shows that the we still had a very low uh, use of digital payments. Uh, including uh, the use of uh, ATMs, although this was not our uh, main objective. Uh, it was noted that if in terms of knowledge, only 64% of the population uh, by the time we were developing the financial development strategy had heard about an ATM, which is really not a very uh, good pieces of information. So to be uh, uh, focused in our uh, research, what we tried to do uh, we, we wanted to uh, find out uh, our, our policy questions uh, way. Uh, can we increase the use of mobile money uh, by combining uh, mobile money and financial literacy training uh, with the reminder short messages? Uh, so the question was, can we, if we combine, if we train uh, the people, uh, mostly we targeted uh, the people in the village savings and loan associations. If we train these people, and uh, after training them, if we, be, if we send them uh, messages to remind them of the training content, can we increase uh, the use of mobile money? That was our, our main uh, risk, uh, policy uh, question. And then they, we, we were also asking ourselves, under which conditions uh, can an, an intervention of this nature be uh, effective. So we, uh, we, when we're asking the second uh, policy question, we're looking at uh, different uh, uh, heterogeneous effect to see which combinations of different characters are making uh, the uh, effects uh, more strong and more significant. I, I should say that we uh, promoted our, or we tested our intervention uh, as I've described it as a, as a package, you can see that we are looking at uh, training in mobile money, uh, uh, training in financial literacy, as well as shows, uh, uh, short uh, messages, uh, services, SMSs. We implemented this as a package because again, we, we, we knew that we, we could have had uh, a number of uh, treatment arms, but they, we already have ob had observed that some uh, studies have found that uh, training on its own is not uh, adequate. So we, we decided to uh, uh, estimate uh, uh, or to check uh, whether uh, combining these uh, would lead to uh, 
uh, uh, changes uh, in the use of uh, mobile money. So th this is uh, uh, what uh, we wanted, the, the questions we wanted uh, to answer. And the, I should say up front that when we were implementing this, in our case, I would say that we, of course, we engaged our, our government, uh, but I should also say that our case, it was, uh, I would call it a public-private uh, partnership type of arrangement, because when it came to government, we worked with uh, two government uh, agencies or ministries. We worked with uh, the Minister of Finance, Economic Planning and Development, and we worked with the Reserve Bank of Malawi. But these were not the only partners in our, uh, our, our work. We also worked with the uh, private uh, sector actors. We worked with the mobile uh, uh, money operators. Two, we have two major mobile money operators in Malawi. We worked with both of them. But because we are also working with VSRAs, we work with non-governmental organizations that are involved uh, in uh, uh, establishing VSRAs uh, for different purposes. So you will see that the way we designed our study is not just working with government, but we were working with everybody uh, who matters in, the, uh, in our question. What we noted was that um, Looking at the, uh, the policy strategy, you realize that the government is uh, promoting uh, use of digital payments uh, as the, uh, a development uh, agenda. But when we look at the uh, 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 mobile money operators, you see that these are promoting the use of mobile money as a commercial uh, uh, product. So what, what, one of the things we wanted to, to, to show uh, the two entities is to show them that while the uh, mobile money operators are pursuing their uh, commercial objectives, the government can be uh, achieving their uh, social objectives. So this is a kind of uh, arrangement uh, we worked uh, on. Now, I've, it, by doing that, I've already started uh, talking about uh, the main challenges uh, as well as uh, what, what we learned from, uh, from the process. So on, on the, uh, uh, the, the, the main ch uh, challenges, as I've said, we work with the two uh, government institutions, the Minister of Finance, uh, Economic Planning and Development, and these are the policy holders uh, for the uh, financial sector development uh, strategy. And we also worked with uh, the Reserve Bank of Malawi, uh, who are supposed uh, to, to be, uh, the act gives them power uh, to make sure that they uh, regulate the use of uh, digital uh, payments. But uh, with a more ad, uh, objective of promoting uh, the use of uh, digital payment. Now, as my colleagues have already said, working with the government is a kind of a trick when it comes to research. Uh, Working with the, for us, even working with the different uh, government agencies uh, also gave us a, uh, different experiences. Uh, I would say that in general, uh, the government will give you a picture to say that they are supporting your work. I rarely have found uh, the government saying that they don't like you, uh, they don't like your work. They will say that they like the work, but most of the times, you would see that the actions, uh, I would still borrow this statement that says actions speak louder. The actions, you will realize that they, what they said and what they are doing, they are not exactly uh, the same. What they are doing, you don't feel the, uh, uh, the support uh, they, they promised. Uh, for the two agencies, I noted, or we noted in our team that the, Minister of Finance, Economic Planning and Development, they were, uh, I would call them a typical of a government uh, department uh, who says, uh, we like this work, uh, we'll support you. And then there isn't much uh, beyond that. But the Reserve Bank of Malawi, we also started working with them. Uh, when we started working with them, others, uh, we see that they were more forthcoming uh, trying to assist as well as we understand uh, what is happening uh, in, the, in the project. So that when we are quite at some point in time, 
you may receive a call and say, uh, how far have you gone uh, with the study? Do you have the results yet? So I, uh, or in our team, we noted that the government agencies, we cannot put them uh, in one basket and just say that they all behave uh, similarly. I should uh, indicate that the journey we move with the, uh, the central bank or the Reserve Bank of Malawi is that up, we started working with them, uh, both the ministry as well as the central bank when we were developing the, uh, the, uh, the proposal. We wrote them and they both uh, promised to be, to be working with them. And after we got the grant, we had uh, organized a, a, an inception meeting which inv that involved all the stake uh, relevant stakeholders, including these uh, key stakeholders and the uh, mobile money operators. Uh, beyond that, we noted that the central bank, the reserve bank, they were even they even assisted us in training our uh, in training the researchers and the research assistants because the way we uh, intervened, the training. Uh, we were trained that by the mobile money operators and the Reserve Bank of Malawi, uh, researchers and research assistants were trained as trainers. So it was a kind of a TOT. And the Reserve Bank, they came and the two mobile money operators, they came. Uh, although the ministry, of course, we didn't give them uh, a particular uh, role to play at that point. Uh, but in general, I would say that the way they, uh, the mobile money operators and the Reserve Bank of Malawi uh, uh, behaved during the training, they really showed that they are up to it and they want to see the results uh, of this study. Uh, beyond this, uh, when we came uh, uh, to, to the end, uh, after the, the, the research, I should say that we kind, uh, when we generated the results and when we were going for the uh, national policy conference, the support by the Reserve Bank of Malawi never changed. Uh, the mobile money operators, they were still uh, very active in supporting this week. Uh, but uh, the ministry, we now saw that the support uh, grew. They, when they started seeing the, uh, the results, they supported the week uh, 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 more than they did uh, throughout the research process. Uh, Rabbi, one of the- we are, we are running out of time, please finish up. Thank you. Uh, so a, a, a general, lesson uh, under that we uh, noted that it's not all the government all the government uh, departments they will, it, it depends on the a, a government uh, uh, department or agency and it also depends on who uh, is the, in that office at that particular point in time we cannot uh, generalize but uh, taking now from what uh, we will still manage to get through this process because of uh, the pay processes so how PEP helped us in this process is when we were beginning the work already, they started uh, talking about our policies, uh, the policy context analysis. They started making us realize that our work should fit into uh, a policy uh, process. And the, when they started talking about, we already started uh, thinking of who uh, should we engage, which policy maker should we engage. I would think if you, this was not stated uh, even at the proposal stage, we couldn't have uh, included uh, uh, these uh, policy uh, makers. And there are a number of uh, uh, processes that others have already uh, uh, stated on, but I just want to emphasize that for us, the initial policy uh, context uh, analysis was very important. I know we had a number of trainings in between, but uh, because this came at proposal development stage, it already has uh, set the tone uh, on a, uh, a policy relevant research that we should develop on. Um, I, I also would want uh, uh, to say that uh, the push uh, we, we experienced mostly for the national policy uh, conference has assisted a lot because this is when we have realized that the Ministry of Finance and Economic Development has kind of changed the tune, changed the interest uh, in the work uh, we did. Uh, such that I think in the, when they will be reviewing, when they'll be developing the new financial uh, development strategy, some of the outcomes from the work uh, we have uh, uh, performed uh, will be taken into consideration. I will, will stop there, Jane. And uh, I think if we, uh, there will be some things that were not clear uh, 
our participants may ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, our panelists, our three panelists. Now we come to the exciting part of uh, Q&A. Uh, we do have uh, two or so questions for the first uh, uh, section on the general paper approach. And uh, I'll be asking maybe Marjorie to answer uh, the three, the two questions that you, we, uh, we have. The first one is how uh, effective have been the policy communication initiatives after projects have been completed uh, regarding the real take up? Um, yes, hi, uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, that, that's actually a very important question. Um, first, I have to specify that we, as we discussed about the PEP monitoring and evaluation system, and that monitoring takes place throughout the project cycle and six months beyond the research is completed. And so we have that period to assess, um, to collect information about uptake. And based on that information, uh, we know that uh, over, well, more than half, now we're 53%, of all the projects that we've supported since, since 2013 have uh, resulted in some sort of uptake. And uptake can take many different forms. Um, in some cases, the, the findings that really had a direct effect or impact on a decision uh, made as part of the policy process, either um, revision, policy revision, reform, or design, or even at, during implementation a feature of the program has been changed based on the findings. Um, and other times it was um, a minister who um, uh, created a policy discussion group involving the researchers and people from many different ministries and agencies to talk about how the findings can inform their uh, current initiatives and it led to informing different kinds of, of, of policy processes. So it, it, it really, depends on the context they want to have, we have many different kinds of stories, but it's important to realize that these stories, they were told within the six months after the, the end of the research cycle. So it's, it's very close, uh, it's very short uh, time, time period. And it may have happened further down the line for other projects, which just, we don't have the manpower to monitor everything, but uh, we do know that uptake, uh, uptake uh, is achieved thanks to our our uh, monitoring system. Yep. Uh, okay. Is there another question? I think you said there were two. Uh, yeah. yeah, yes. The, so, the, yes, yeah. go ahead. I see it. Can you please make a clear distinction between research and policy questions? Uh, that, that's one question. And then are there free training, policy engagement management and policy communications or how can young researchers benefit from PEP, policy engagement mentorship? So quickly, uh, I don't want to get into the whole course about distincting uh, research questions and policy questions, but I'd say quickly that research question will provide an information about the state of situation, whereas the policy question is really about what are, what's the, my best option uh, for uh, action. So we go through a whole process of sort of uh, for each project, understanding what's the difference, what, what it means, these differences for each project. Now, um, are there free training? Well, we, the mentorship program is part of the PEP support program. So it's part of a grant, it's, it's embedded into one project, but the training itself, we are uh, considering right now, you know, the workshops, we will make them online uh, eventually. And uh, yeah, they should be easy to access. So, so this can be made available for, um, for a broader um, uh, range of, of re interested researchers, but it's not yet there. Um, yeah, I think, and there was, yeah, I think that's it for me, right, so. Okay, uh, 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 Marjorie, there's just one that has come up uh, from Raura Barasas is asking. Yep, uh, Okay, yeah. she's asking, what would you advise us to look out for when selecting government officials as team members? For instance, should we ask a ministry to propose team members or approach them individually? And after that, I think we'll go to Guillermo to answer his questions. He has two questions, yeah. 
Yeah, it's definitely it's a good question. I think both uh, both answers are right. I mean, it depends on the context. Uh, I think that going to a ministry and asking the head of or a government institution asking the head of that institution to identify who would be the best uh, liaison or uh, the best person to to part participate in the project is a good way to go. It really it generates buy-in from the institution as a whole. Whereas, uh, but you can also, if it's not possible to do that, because it, it depends on the contact, on the, the access level, if it's not possible, then you can use existing contacts to, uh, to, to join the project and then get there, who work in that institution and then talk to the head and, and, and involve the institution. So I think both ways can, can work. Okay. Uh... Thanks. Maybe can I add something on this? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Because um, when we were also looking for the teams and other institutions, we also um, we were also looking for for who who to, who to choose, and we did as you said. We reached out to the head of the institutions to propose some people, but then, I mean, this you know, depending on the context, might not necessarily fit to the best team member. So afterwards, we got a we got a um, group of five people um, that were recommended to us, and then we kind of just interviewed them actually, or just kind of heard them how interested they would be to work in this project if they have the intrinsic motivation, um, what skills they can bring to to to, to work in the team. So um, yeah, that's 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 how we did it. Kind of yeah, approached both ways, but I think it's important to to if you make a team. I think it's very important that the team functions well and that you get along. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let's go to Guillermo. Guillermo, there, there are uh, some two or three questions for you. Uh, I think you may have responded to some on the chat. Uh, one of the, them asks, which strategies have been used to face uh, or had challenges regarding making collaboration between different independent agencies? Uh, three in the case of, of Argentina to work successfully. You can respond to that at the other question if you have not responded to it on the chat, please. Are you there? Yes, you thank you. V very interesting question. Um, I think uh, it was a crash course in in diplomacy. Um, in some cases, um, I knew the, the, the bosses of the agencies, for instance, the, the, I knew personally the head of the social security agency. Oops, that was my cat, sorry. Um, but um, I could have, um, when some people in the agency were reluctant to, to help or to provide data, I could have appealed to my friend, to my colleague and, and say, well, please, uh, be tough on, on this and, and ensure that people collaborate. But um, I learned that that was not a very useful strategy to try to force things. So um, in some cases, I was underusing um, the little influence I had and trying to convince people little by little. So I think uh, not being forceful, uh, being, um, I would call it a, a process almost of seduction of uh, the, the, the policy partners, like trying to convince them and that you will collaborate and that you will not do anything that would um, put them in any kind of danger politically, administratively, legally, etc. is the way to go. It doesn't always work. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's not always... Um, it's not always obvious that, that agencies will collaborate, but going slowly and, and, and smoothly is, I think, the way to go. Okay. Uh, thank you. Maybe uh, we could uh, give time to people who may not have written their questions and they want to ask questions. We still have a few, maybe up to about 10 minutes. Uh, but meanwhile, there's a question I see I think it's not addressed to anyone, but maybe Sebastian could answer that. Sebastian, one of the researcher, the, 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 the participants is asking, how do we overcome political will 
or wound when trying to broker partnerships with government to engage in policy research exercises or activities? Maybe what's your experience? Is Sebastian there? Yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, the question, can you please make a clear distinction between research and, no, that was not it. What was the no, question? No, it's asking, can I read it again? Yes. How do we overcome political want? It's written want, but I think it's will or political maybe interference when trying to broker partnership with government to engage in policy research exercises or activities. Hmm. Um, yeah, difficult question. I mean, <clears throat> we, um, we were lucky that we have the government team that we worked with was a quite stable team, irrespective of the general political situation that we have had, have and had. So um, they would, they always worked on the topic, even if it was not in during working hours, but also outside of working hours um, and on the weekends. In terms of the communication that this um, project is on, ongoing, um, was sometimes a bit difficult due to the frequent changes that we had in the government, but it Anna? did not impact the um, the functioning of the of the project that much. Okay, uh, thank you. That was actually a very general question. It could apply to any situation. I just asked you because you, uh, being an economic advisor and having to work with both researchers and policy uh, makers, I thought you might be in a good position to answer that. Mm. Um, I don't see any hard raised up. Does anyone? have a question other than the ones that have been picked up because I know uh, most of the ones we have have been responded to either live or on the chat. Um, Anyone? Yes? Jean, can, the, I see a, a last question, anonymous attendee say, asking, how do we deal with the challenge of policymakers who participate in such research wanting to be paid for their time? And well, I can just say how Pep addresses that is that we provide a, a that's why we ask the, the, these members to be considered as full time, as fully team members, because when we provide the, the research grant uh, to be allocated amongst members, they allocated them, uh, they allocate this this um, this grant uh, uh, among them according to the work they do and the, the, the extent of participation. So I guess it's it's a matter of sharing, uh, sharing the, the the work and the research grant for us. I mean. Thank you. And I see, I see a question from At Atakiti asking, uh, does PEP part for basic research? I don't know what you mean by basic research. Maybe, I don't know whether it's tran uh, translation. Maybe it's not policy research, would be more. Um... The point is that any research we, we find, we expect uh, now the area what we are calling co-production, research teams working with government teams. But uh, maybe uh, uh, we, we are happy to discuss further if, there's, uh, if, if, if the person asking the question can actually elaborate. So do we have any other question? Because if not, then I'll ask the panelists, maybe even one, uh, wants to say anything else? Maria Raura, do you have any perspective of any of the questions? Nothing was directly posed to you, but just in case you have anything before we conclude. No, I... we... To take on this uh, question in basic research, if I am, sometimes we do have uh, basic research questions that are embedded into the into the policy relevant evaluations and i think that these are like we have some successful experience uh, in uganda um, and in i think now in cote d'ivoire so that we use like some some uh, research hypotheses that are important building uh, a broader policy evaluation 
but this is has to, I mean, at the end of the day, it has to have some uh, important prescription for policy. Uh, Okay. Any other? Any other panelists? Guillermo, Sebastian, Revison, anyone who wants to add anything before we close? Yeah. Uh, I... Yes, I, 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 I just uh, say one thing on the, the question that one of the uh, participants uh, asked about payment to. Um, government officials. Uh, as it has been noted, this is the dead board. If you were with them, it, when you were forming the team, it's easy, as the uh, majority has said, it means uh, they will be part of the onlelia. But if you are just inviting them to participate after I've already come up with a proposal, like the, the way it was with us, then uh, it becomes necessary that uh, you should still you, you don't pay them for working, but you should facilitate uh, their work. In other words, their participation. If they are coming to attend a meeting to meet you, that should be facilitated by uh, you. Uh, you don't uh, expect government to pay uh, for their uh, travel and the uh, uh, accommodation, for example. Sometimes they just want you to facilitate that and they are happy to participate in your research. I just wanted to add, uh, that bit. Okay, Guriyama, you are saying something before we think we close up. Yes, no, I, I just wanted to um, to thank you again and say that um, sometimes projects just don't work out. Or um, as Sebastian was saying, they had three treatment arms with uh, one million beneficiaries, and maybe we end up with one, etc. Um, I, I think one of the messages is that we we need to be um, as flexible as we can in, in adapting uh, to the reality. Um, just just that uh, will help. If, if we have a very close design and, and everything is too specific, um, it will be less flexible and, and it will be much riskier. Um, but at the end of the day, some of these projects uh, just don't work out or fall through, or there's a change in government, in agency, et cetera. And, uh, that happens and, and we need to also to learn with to live with that frustration sometimes right okay uh okay thank you Major, um, you want to say something before so, we... well, i see there are two other interesting very interesting questions that I, I think we should address quickly if we have a few minutes uh well maybe a minute uh the first one is how do policy strategies differ according to the receptiveness of the policy institution um, I think our main advice in these cases has been that if the one policy institution is not receptive, maybe because of uh, political risks or anything, there are always ways to, to work with uh, other institutions. It, it's not a, a policy issue is never tackled by only one or really only one area. It, other areas, other kind of organizations also can be, um, can be involved, whether NGOs or uh, development partners that can uh, help um, bring about influence on, on the policy debate. So that would be my, my, my answer to that, to that. And the second question was the issue of COVID-19 context as, as missed in the discussion, and that's, that's true. And could Pep highlight instances, now instances of what I'm not sure, but um, we've had that happening a lot uh, with ongoing projects where the COVID crisis occurred in the middle of it and I think that maybe Maria Laura can answer that question because you had to and actually the the Sebastian as well you had to um, uh, adapt to that new context in the middle of a project uh, or, or a strategy do you want to say a few words on this Maria Laura or Sebastian um, how so our our COVID our impact is our project was um, substantially um, that we had difficulties with the lockdown to get everything ready to get the service going. I mean, we had to work with the MTN mobile company, but they were in home office. We had to get the short code and negotiate not to um, not, not, not to pay for it. So that delayed things a bit. 
But in the end, it also, I mean, COVID also mean the big impact on commodity prices. So we actually saw you know, 10% increase, 100% uh, increase in the farm gate prices. So this also actually made the project even more relevant than, uh, than it was before. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think as Marjorie has said, I think we, we, we've had six uh, projects uh, that were carrying out interventions. And uh, at least five, about five of them were affected by COVID and we've had to do adjustments. That's what uh, uh, Marjorie was asking Maria Rauda to comment about. But uh, I think for the interest of time, we have only uh, three minutes. I just want to note that uh, Alian uh, sending greetings from Ottawa is asking that, uh, okay, first he's very happy to join, but he's asking whether we will document the experiences we've had so far. And uh, yes, we'll be documenting this and uh, sharing. Uh, but other than that, I think I want us to uh, come to across to this meeting. Uh, I want to thank the panelists uh, because they have read us in a very illuminating discussions uh, this morning, this evening, depending on where we are. We've heard first about the general approach uh, from Maria Raura and uh, Marjorie, uh, telling us a bit how we handle the issues of combining uh, research and policy uh, engagement or co-production of research uh, with policy makers. And then we've looked at the three examples, one from Guillermo in Argentina uh, on the Cardius, then we've recent to ground nuts in Guinea-Bissau. And then we have talked about financial inclusion in Marawi. And what this tells you is that uh, though we didn't even have anyone from Asia, but there was a question whether we do this one in Asia, this is uh, applicable worldwide. And we've had more or less the same project. Uh, some, in some cases, we do have the same projects taking place in Asia now, actually, on COVID. We also have one uh, project in uh, Eastern Europe, in Macedonia, but looking at COVID, but we still have the issue of uh, the policy makers working with the researchers. Uh, all in all, I want to thank everyone, uh, but just to note that uh, we, as we do this, and as we document our experiences, we continue looking for support to expand our activities uh, so as to inform the critical policy decisions such as those related to co-production of research. And I think as has been mentioned, especially by Sebastian, it's not necessarily an easy task. Uh, researchers tend to fear this whole idea of being told to go to the policy makers. But what we are showing is that it is doable. It can be done and it's being done. Uh, so we will continue trying to strive to ensure that we have co-production of research. I want to thank all of you we started with more than 100 people. Now I see we are about 72. So I want to thank all of you for braving uh, to stay in to listen for two hours. Uh, the link has been given. We'll be sharing uh, the recording of this. And the link has been given. And in case you have questions to ask, if you go to our website, you'll be able to see our email, info at pep. Send your questions if you feel we did not answer any uh, or uh, find a way of contacting us and we'll be happy to respond to you. So we look forward to maybe interacting with you soon. We may have uh, some more webinars coming up before the end of the year, maybe towards the end of the month or early December. Uh, but I assume that all of you who are attending have registered as members in our website or in our intranet, because if you register, you definitely get the call. If you have not, please register uh, as a member of the PEP network uh, so that then you'll be getting our correspondence. So again, thank you panelists. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you our technical team, Jenny, Raul, and Michael for the background support. I thank all of you and have a nice day. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.